Suppose you have some important knowledge you want to convey. Maybe you're an expert in some area. But because of the kind of person you're perceived as being, maybe because you're black or a woman or working class, you aren't treated as being a knower, as being an expert. That's epistemic injustice. Hello, welcome to Attic Philosophy. On this channel, we're talking about logic, metaphysics, language, the mind, social philosophy. Today, we're going to be focusing in on an important topic in social philosophy, epistemic injustice. The kind of harms done to somebody as a knower because of the kind of person they are or because of how they are perceived as being. I'm going to talk you through two important writers on epistemic injustice. Christy Dotson and Miranda Fricker. They're both contemporary philosophers. Christy Dotson comes from a tradition of black feminism. Miranda Fricker comes more from a tradition of traditional analytic philosophy. And they're kind of meeting together on this topic of epistemic injustice. I'm going to start off with an idea that's articulated nicely in Miranda Fricker's book, Epistemic Injustice. There's a link down in the description. This is the concept of testimonial injustice. So here the idea is you are giving testimony. That is, you're trying to convey your knowledge either in words or in conversation. And because of the kind of person you're perceived as being, you're not deemed trustworthy. Here's a nice example of testimonial injustice. Harper Lee's book To Kill a Mockingbird is set in Depression era Alabama in the US. One of the main plot devices focuses in on a black man, Tom Robinson, who's been accused of raping a white woman, Mayella. Here's the trial scene from the 1962 film version. You did all this chopping and work out of sheer goodness, boy? <laughs> you mighty good fella, it seems. Did all that for not one penny? Yes, sir. I felt right sorry for her. She seemed... You see the look in Tom's eyes there. He realises that he's made a mistake in saying he feels sorry for this white woman. You felt sorry for her? A white woman? You felt sorry for her? So what's going on here is the prosecutor is saying to Tom, how could you, a black man, feel sorry for a white woman. Now, Tom's explanation of his actions is perfectly legitimate. He felt sorry for this woman, so he went to help her. But the idea that in 30s Alabama, a black man of so much lower social status than a white woman could feel sorry for a white woman, it isn't credible in this setting. He's not treated as speaking the truth, even though he was. And even though to our eyes, what he's saying is perfectly credible. It's an example of epistemic injustice, testimonial injustice. Purely because he was a black man talking about a white woman, he can't be believed as saying, I felt sorry for her. So I guess we can all think of lots of other examples in which this kind of phenomena occurs. Somebody isn't treated as knowing, as being an expert, because of the kind of person they are. This happens all the time with female academics, it happens with working class academics, it happens with working class politicians, and it happens where race is involved all the time. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on and talk about another aspect of epistemic injustice. This is the idea of testimonial smothering, and it comes from Dotson's paper, Tracking Epistemic Violence, Tracking Practices of Silencing. Again, I've got a link down in the description. So it's not like testimonial injustice where maybe I'm trying to convey some knowledge um, and, and my audience don't believe me. Rather, it's a case in which I curtail what I'm saying because I don't feel confident in my audience's ability to interpret me as a knower. So to get our heads around the concept, we have to wind back a bit and think about what makes for a successful 
conversation, for a successful bit of testimony. Maybe I'm giving a lecture or I'm delivering this video or whatever. It seems like it's all down to me, right? I have to say the right things, I have to say true things, and I have to put them in a way that my audience can understand. So when I'm lecturing, yeah, I have to do all of that. But it's not all about me, the speaker. The audience have to be open-minded. They have to be in a position to really hear what I'm saying. And they have to be in a position to say, OK, that person is conveying information. We need to kind of latch on to that. And also they need to convey that back to me. So I need my audience to give me some signals that they are receptive to what I'm saying. So this is the idea of reciprocity. OK, Jennifer Hornsby talks about this quite a lot. It's the idea that there is this two way interaction between the speaker and the audience. Even if the speaker is doing all the talking, like, like you would do in a lecture, the audience have to reciprocate in terms of being open and signalling that they're open to what the speaker's saying. Now, you can imagine a case where I've got something to say or someone's got something to say to their audience, but the audience are not being reciprocal. Perhaps they're just not indicating that they're receptive at all. Perhaps they're indicating open hostility to what you've got to say. And perhaps that's because of the kind of person you are. So you can imagine a female academic addressing an all-male audience. That might be a case where she decides that the audience aren't being reciprocal. The audience aren't being open to what she has to say. And she decides to curtail her testimony. Now, we're not talking here about cases of being unsure or not confident enough to stand in front of people and say things. Rather, we're talking about the content of what the speaker is saying being in some way unsafe in that context. Maybe it's a person of colour and they are talking about their experiences of racial injustice. And perhaps it's to an all-white audience who have indicated some kind of hostility. And the speaker decides this just isn't a safe environment for me to speak my truth. And in that case, they might decide to say, I'm just not going to say those things. That would be a case of testimonial smothering. The speaker has decided to curtail her testimony because of the lack of reciprocity on behalf of the audience. According to Dotson, there has to be three conditions in place for this to be a case of testimonial smothering. First, the content of what the speaker is saying has to be in some way unsafe or risky. So, for instance, our speaker might be a person of colour speaking about their experiences of racial injustice. Second component, the audience has failed to demonstrate their competence as, a, as an audience with an open mind to the speaker. Third component, the basis for that lack of testimonial competence has to be in some way pernicious. So it isn't just that they are school children who have no interest in the topic or first year students who haven't got enough background concepts. Rather, it has to be some implicit or explicit judgment about the person's, the speaker's social group. Some kind of judgment that because they're a person of colour, because they're female, because they're working class or whatever, they aren't competent to deliver that knowledge as experts. Putting all of that together, Dotson says that testimonial smothering is truncating one's own testimony in order to ensure that the testimony contains only content for which one's audience demonstrates testimonial competence. Dotson gives a nice example of testimonial smothering. It comes from an article by Cassandra Byers Harvin called Conversations I Can't Have. Harvin's a black academic. She describes an example in which she's researching in the library and a white woman asks her what she's working on. And Harvin says, I'm trying to understand how to raise black sons in this society. And the white woman responds by saying, well, how's that any different from raising white sons? Now, Harvin notes two issues here. Not only is the question problematic because it fails to demonstrate any awareness of the racial context in the US, but it's also the tone of the question. There's an implied making something out of nothing. Harvin decided this is a conversation she couldn't have. So rather than entering into the discussion, defending her own position, she politely excused herself and left. It was a conversation she couldn't have. She curtailed her own expert testimony. It was a case of testimonial smothering. The third kind of concept I want to talk about today, again from Fricker, is hermeneutical injustice. 
Hermeneutical injustice, it's when a socially disadvantaged group is blocked from either access to knowledge or from communicating that knowledge because of the social group they're in. Fricker says it's the injustice of having some significant area of one's social experience obscured from collective understanding owing to a structural identity prejudice in the collective hermeneutical resource. Hermeneutical here means relating to interpretation. Fricker gives the example of the concept of sexual harassment. Okay, so we all know what that concept involves nowadays. In the 70s, women who were experiencing sexual harassment didn't have that concept in their vocabulary, okay? The, the concept wasn't in people's minds. And the problem was they didn't know how to articulate their experience. So all of the kind of workplace, inappropriate touching, groping, comments, they didn't have a way to contextualize that and to communicate their experience. This kind of behavior didn't fall into the traditional concept of harassment, okay? Of, of being beaten up or something like that, being threatened. It was something significantly different. And until women had that concept, they didn't have a clear way to articulate and express and share their experience. Talking about these kind of cases, Rachel McKinnon says, groping, leering, following, lewd comments and such in the workplace typically didn't rise to meet the standard for critical harassment. So referring to them as harassment was unavailable. By understanding these concepts, understanding the views behind them, knowing that these issues happen and knowing that we can contextualize them using these concepts, these are steps towards building a better, fairer, more just society. I want to finish with an important aspect about the way we talk about epistemic injustice. What we've got to be careful to do is not forget the huge amount of work that was being done over, I don't know, a hundred years by black feminists on epistemic injustice. Okay, guys, that's it for today. I've really enjoyed talking about this topic. I think it's super important. We've got to have more discussions about this. Hopefully I'm going to make more videos on these kind of issues, social philosophy in general, in the future. So if you want more videos like this, hit subscribe and get them delivered to your inbox. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about these issues. Question for you guys. What kind of issues of epistemic injustice have you experienced or maybe have you contributed to? It's really great to air these, to talk about them, to get them in the open. Leave me a comment. Let me know what other kind of topics you'd like me to talk about. Okay, that's it for today. See you next time.